Hello everyone, it's Stevie Morrison here. Welcome to this short presentation on respiratory pathophysiology, specifically COPD. Okay then, <clears throat> so COPD or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, as I'm sure you know, is a fairly common respiratory condition involving <laughs> obviously the airways and is characterised by airflow obstruction. Now, exacerbations and comorbidities um, contribute to the overall severity in individual patients. Let's look at the signs and symptoms of COPD then. <coughs> Excuse me for coughing. So, patients with COPD usually present with three cardinal symptoms. Um, and I'm sure you, you've experienced these. And we're going to look at how these occur, um, thinking about micro and macro changes within uh, the lungs, okay? So, we'll start by saying, of course, they usually present with three cardinal signs and symptoms. And these are breathlessness, so dyspnea, um, a cough, uh, specifically a chronic cough, and sputum production, so phlegm. Um, there are also less common uh, symptoms too, um, and these include wheezing and chest tightness. Although wheezing is commonly associated with asthma, um, the main cardinal symptoms or signs are breathlessness, coughing and sputum production. So before we move on to looking at what's happening <coughs> inside the lungs of someone like Stevie with a chronic cough who's got asthma, um, well, I'm, I'm sure we, know, we, we also know that the main risk factor for COPD is, is smoking, cigarette smoking, which is the case in 95% plus of patients diagnosed with COPD. So that is the big risk factor. But of course, there are also other things. So, you know, given the amount of traffic on the roads, um, petrochemical industry, uh, air travel and other things that pollute our atmosphere, that is clearly one of the um, risk factors. Um, cannabis smoking too, of course, released uh, recent um, or recurrent lung infections. And in terms of, um, uh, sort of other morbidities, low birth weight, <coughs> uh, children are, are more likely to grow up with asthma, poverty, so low socioeconomic status, um, and that, you know, I think we'll probably touch on that a bit later too, it's probably, or or maybe because um, housing is often, although not always, poorer in people who are uh, le less um, flush, if you like, in terms of socioeconomic status. And of course, there is also a thing called alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. So some people with a, a protein that is missing um, or um, there is less of it within the propria the, 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 the lung tissue, um, are more likely to develop COPD. So those are the risk factors for COPD. Now remember then, COPD stands for Chronic Obstructive Pulmonary Disease and I will apologise now because I may occasionally, because I'm from the old, <laughs> I'm a bit older <clears throat> than most of you probably, I may occasionally call it a, a Chronic Obstructive Airways Disease because that's what we used to call it. Anyway, COPD, Chronic Obstructive Pulmonary Disease, a disease that um, encompasses a variety of disease processes of suppose we could say. But just like there are three cardinal signs and symptoms, there are three big COP disease processes. And as you can see on the slide, those are chronic asthma, um, chronic bronchitis and emphysema. Now for the purposes of this lecture, um, we'll be focusing on the latter two of those because there are, as a separate slide set 
um, and recorded lecture uh, for asthma. Okay. But before we look at those two diseased processes in a bit more detail, let's just briefly stop and consider asthma. Okay, because although there's a separate lecture in this, um, I'm including this here simply for completeness. Because there is an element of asthma in COP disease. Okay, now in the past that was not necessarily considered to be the case. But most respiratory specialists will tell you that although there is chronic bronchitis and chronic, uh, sorry, and emphysema, and some patients have more chronic bronchitis than emphysema, but they have both. Some patients have more emphysema than chronic bronchitis, but they have both. Uh, all COPD patients are likely to have an element of asthma. Okay. So then, asthma is a chronic inflammatory disorder of the airways. Um, and there are many cells and cellular elements that are involved in that. And I'll go into that in a bit of detail in the other set of slides, okay? Um, so these elements and cellular elements and many, and many, many cells I've mentioned, they certainly contribute to what I would describe as the main signs and symptoms of asthma. And these are episodes of wheezing, um, breathlessness, chest tightness, and coughing. Okay? And that's all I'm going to say about chronic asthma at this point. Because as I've already pointed out, there's a separate set of slides on that. Okay? So you can pick it up. You can pick up on this again uh, in the asthma lecture slides. Okay? Good stuff. Okay then. Although I did, I, I did um, hesitate on using this terminology because although it's perhaps frowned upon these days, patients that present with chronic bronchitis are sometimes, or they certainly were in the past, certainly have been referred to as blue bloaters. Now, I'm not a fan of stereotypes, of course, um, but when you talk about chronic bronchitis, the blue bloater sort of um, image uh, that it creates in the in mind of an experienced clinician ca ca kind of can be explained scientifically. So although it is a stereotype, it does for the most part hold true. And the image on the screen in that sort of diagrammatic representation of a stereotypical uh, patient with chronic bronchitis. Uh, may very well be what appeared in your mind when I said blue bloater. Those of you that have dealt with these patients a lot over the years will probably have a very clear picture in your mind, not of that guy in the, the graphic there, but of patients you've dealt with who fit that sort of criteria. So yeah, okay, it's a stereotype and it's perhaps a bit of a, a dated uh, way of describing things, but I think it helps people understand it and remember it. So I'll apologise if that's offensive in any way. That makes sense. So blue bloaters are patients that present looking very cyanosed. And that's probably due to breathlessness. Um, and I mean breathlessness to the point where it, it leads to a general deterioration. So they're so breathless, they're not maybe able to do all the things that they've done in the past. So there's a lack of exercise as well as a low level of oxygen in the blood um, and as that happens continually uh, as we'll go into it uh, 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 as we go through the lecture um, there'll be a lack of exercise um, low level of oxygen and then that may lead to some uh, or lead to um, right heart failure sorry I had a wee mental blank there for a second it may lead to a bit of right heart failure. And we'll come back to that. Okay? So, okay. So, in chronic bronchitis, you have inflammatory changes leading to what we call mucociliary dysfunction. Um, an increased goblet 
self-secretion and indeed numbers. Okay, right, so to get our heads around this, let's look at a normal alveoli. Sorry, I've clicked that too early. So let's look at this normal alveoli, okay. Um, there's oxygen coming in and of course that uh, a normal gaseous exchange mean that we ha means that we have uh, uh, carbon dioxide going out. So normal uh, ventilation and perfusion or normal VQ as we often ab abbreviate that to. These normal alveoli have elastic fibres surrounding them. So think of it as, you know, the layers of smooth muscle that constrict and um, dilate to allow um, breathing to take place and as this recoil forces out the CO2. Okay, so fibrous, uh, the fibres of elasticity that surround these alveoli recoil during expiration and that pushes air out and of course, as I've said, that includes carbon dioxide. So that animation there seemed to stick the last time and uh, I, 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 yeah, I'll, have to, I'll have to watch for that. Right, okay. Back on track then. If if we look now at an alveoli and a bronchial, a patient with chronic bronchitis, these will be much different, very different from a healthy alveoli. Now, I've used the same graphic so that the, the text is what we're going to focus on. Okay, so there's a VQ mismatch in blue bloaters, there's bronchoconstriction and overproduction of mucus. Okay. So the bronchioles and the bronchi in a patient with uh, COPD or, or as a chronic bronchitis have bronchoconstriction and then sort of hypersecretion of mucus, I suppose you would say. And that hypersecretion of mucus leads to a productive cough that is fairly common in chronic bronchitis. In turn then, the airway obstruction from this bronchoconstriction and the mucus overproduction leads to the wheezing that we'll often hear, um, typically during expiration. Does that make sense? I hope so. When there is uh, airway obstruction, this can also mean that there is alveolar hypoxia. So there's less oxygen gets into the alveolar space um, because there's not enough oxygen getting in. That will lead to this VQ mismatch. So there's not enough oxygen going in, there may not be enough carbon dioxide going out and therefore there is a ventilation and perfusion mismatch. And that can lead to hypoxia and hypercapnia. Hypoxia being, uh, sorry if I'm teaching my granny to suck eggs here, a low blood oxygen level and hypercapnia being um, a high blood CO2 level and in turn a respiratory acidosis. Also, it's worth remembering that while this is all going on, this prolonged decrease in oxygen in the blood, that often means that the body will try to make up for that. It will try to um, sort of fill the gap there, if you like, in terms of oxygenation. And it does that by producing more red blood cells to compensate. And of course, we call that polycythemia. So bronchoconstriction here in the airways leads and the, and the production of uh, sputum as you can see that's green <laughs> for sputum um, leads to there being less oxygen coming in and less carbon dioxide going out so we get a VQ mismatch, hypoxemia and hypercapnia. Clear? I hope so. Okay then. So, where there is an increase in haemoglobin, so polycythemia, uh, respiratory acidosis, so an increase in CO2, and a decrease in blood oxygen, so hypoxemia, there is often, if not always, a leukocyanosis. In other words, these patients often look blue. So think about that. There's an increase in haemoglobin, so they look sort of redder, if you like, flushed. So there's more haemoglobin. Um, the respiratory acidosis will often make patients flushed, so they're re redder yet again. Um, 
that's due to the CO2, obviously. And the decrease in oxygen, so there's more red, red blood cells, but there's less oxygen to attach to them. So these red blood cells go darker, um, and between the flushing from the CO2, the uh, increased hemoglobin and the lack of oxygen to attach to it, that's why these patients have this blue tinge uh, and sometimes can look very blue. So the fact that these patients um, have this decreased level of activity due to shortness of breath that we've previously mentioned, um, so they may have put weight on and may also have an element of right heart failure leading to ischitis and edema means that they are often referred to as blue bloaters. So they're slightly larger because they're not as active as they were, so they put weight on. They might have a bit of right heart failure, so there's a bit of fluid in their tissue or tissues. And they're very uh, hypoxemic with extra red blood cells with no oxygen attached to them. And can look a bit flushed due to the CO2. And you add all of that together and you get uh, what we would sometimes refer to as a a blue bloater. Right, so recap again then. Okay, so chronic airway obstruction means that during respiration and because of bronchial and bronchial constriction, as well as mucus overproduction, less oxygen comes in and less carbon dioxide goes out. And that leads to a decrease of oxygen in the blood and an increase of carbon dioxide in the blood. Okay, make sense? So when that happens, the pulmonary blood vessels can constrict. So this VQ mismatch can lead to a constriction in the coronary uh, blood vessels so that in turn uh, it can shunt. So shunt, what, what's another way to describe that? Sort of move the blood forward, um, push it forwards, actively move it due to the constriction. That's a, like a squeezing uh, of a toothpaste tube, perhaps. So it can shunt or move blood uh, towards healthier alveoli in an attempt to prove, improve gaseous exchange. But of course, when you get pulmonary vasoconstriction, you obviously therefore get an increase in pulmonary vascular pressure, so pulmonary hypertension. And when you get pulmonary hypertension, this can cause some of the blood to backflow. So if the pressure ahead of you, if you're the blood, if the pressure ahead of you is higher, it's going to be more difficult to get there. Think of it as a bit like a traffic jam or busy traffic in the, in the town or city centre. When the traffic is busy and there's more of it, there is less space and therefore you get traffic jams. So think of it like that. The blood flow due to pulmonary hypertension means that some of the blood um, can't continue to move forward, so it changes direction, a bit like you or I in our car, to find another way to get there. Um, and when it does that, it backflows and can cause um, core pulmonale or right-sided heart failure caused by COPD. Okay? Right? So core pulmonary then, right-sided heart failure due to pulmonary hypertension caused by vasoconstriction in the pulmonary vasculature can lead to an increase in jugular venous pressure. So again, think about the anatomy of that, the physiology of that. If the pressure in the pulmonary vasculature is high, it means that the blood cannot continue to flow forward, so it may flow back. As it flows back, it comes out into the um, the jugular veins, and of course the jugular veins uh, fill up, and that pushes fluid up that jugular vein, and that's why the jugular venous pressure is often more visible in patients with right heart failure. Does that make sense? High pressure in the lungs in terms of vascular pressure, pushes blood back into the right side of the heart. The right side of the heart, therefore, cannot take blood um, as well from the, returning from the body to the right side. Therefore, there is an increase in pressure in the jugular 
veins and therefore you visualise that with an increased JVP that's often visible um, and sometimes uh, as far up as the patient's ear, unfortunately. Does that make sense? Now, remember we know that pulmonary vasoconstriction of some vessels leads to pulmonary hypertension. And pulmonary hypertension leads to backflow to the right side of the heart. Yes? And that can lead to right heart failure. But there's more bad news, of course. Because where there is backflow, yeah, where there's backflow, that means there's less blood going forwards as well to the left side of the heart. And of course, this can lead to a decrease in left ventricular cardiac output. Okay? So, there's backflow here, okay? So there's backflow, which increases the pulmonary artery pressure and causes potentially right heart failure. Okay? Um, so there's backflow here. Okay, there's less CO2 going out. This means that there's less blood because of the backflow here into the right heart and up into the jugular, up into the jugular vein there is less blood flowing into the right side of the heart and therefore into the left side of the heart. Okay? So, that's the bad news. If blood doesn't move forwards from the right side, it backs up into the blood vessels in the uh, outside the heart on the right side, but it also leads to a backlog in the left side of the heart and that can lead to decreased cardiac output and a decrease in circulatory volume. So we're in a vicious cycle now, aren't we? That's, a, that's a quite a nasty vicious cycle. Does that make sense? Because as a decrease in circulating volume uh, occurs, that activates the renin-angiotensin system, which causes more fluid to be retained via the kidneys even although there is fluid stuck in a traffic jam in the right side of the heart and in the lungs. This, of course, um, is only in the more severe cases of heart, um, COPD and, and chronic bronchitis, and is why heart failure is such a horrible chain of events, isn't it? And why ACE inhibitors are so effective in heart failure, because they interrupt that renin-angiotensin pathway. So, to sum up then, and I, I hope that's all made sense, this has been about the blue bloaters of chronic bronchitis and COPD. They are cyanosed, present with uh, wheezing, a productive cough, or indeed a non-productive cough if related to heart failure, but certainly a very prominent cough. Okay then, pink puffers, again, although perhaps frowned upon these days that we use such terms, patients that present with emphysema are sometimes, or have been, as I said about blue bloaters, are often, or have been referred to as pink puffers. Now I've already said I'm not a fan of stereotypes, but when we talk about emphysema, and I'm sure those of you with clinical experience of dealing with patients with emphysema um, will probably agree that emphysema pink puffers can be explained scientifically and I'm going to attempt to do that to justify my use of stereotypes. So, like before, although a stereotype, it does for the most part hold up. And as you can see from the image on this screen, um, that's probably what you thought of when I said pink puffer, if you've experienced of looking after these patients. Would that be fair? I hope I'm not off the mark here. Okay, then pink puffers are the COPD patients who have 
emphysema, more emphysema than bronchic chronic bronchitis. So they are often very skinny with muscle wasting and have a prominent thoracic cage, as you can see in this guy here. Sometimes referred to as a barrel chest. And we'll discuss why, okay? So, so emphysema is an inflammatory response which leads to the elastic fibres uh, breaking down. So there's breakdown of the and destruction of the elastic fibres. And of course, that means um, that the alveolar wall is less... Um, there's loss of integrity in the alveolar wall. And so when there is no alveolar recoil, um, that can cause problems. So there's less or no elasticity left. So during expiration, there's no recoil that pushes the CO2 out. And that's why there are problems uh, here. This leads to the phenomenon known as air trapping. Is that a term you're familiar with? So these patients at the end of expiration have more air left in the alveoli. Um, and we call it air trapping. And it's fairly typical of emphysematous patients. So, to try and help make sense of that, let's look at a diagram of a normal versus an abnormal uh, emphysematous alveoli. Now, although it's a fairly basic graphic, I think it highlights the key issues of the loss of elasticity and overall destruction of the alveolar integrity. Would you agree? And if you look at the one on the left of the screen and the one on the right of the screen, there's clearly a very defined shape and structure. On the right side, it looks, well, a, a, a less so. Okay then, mm, let's see if we can think about that in more detail. Let's look at the destruction here then. So in a bit more detail, this diagram is, as before, but only showing the alveoli with emphysema, um, has oxygen coming in and CO2 going out. Okay? But this time, uh, if you look beneath the graphic, so you look beneath the graphic, this here is the pulmonary blood supply, okay? Also, there are usually macrophages within the alveoli, or the alveolus, okay? And their job, their job is to keep it clean. So they're a bit like the housekeeper, if you like. They're, they're there to tidy up, they're there to keep it clean. They take care of any bacteria that may have found their way in to the alveolus, um, therefore keeping it sterile, okay? So, an emphysema due to smoking or inhalation of pollution or indeed other toxic substances, these macrophages are stimulated and begin to secrete protease and cytokines, okay? In turn, then, this leads to a number of things. For example, cytokine release attracts neutrophils from the circulation. Okay, so um, that's a neutrophil being attracted to the area because of the cytokines. And as a consequence of that, the neutrophils begin secreting um, elastase which is also a protease, incidentally. So they, they, they secrete another protease, but specifically elastase. And elastase specifically targets the elastic tissue. So, el el so elastase secreted by neutrophils leads to deterioration of the elastic fibres around the alveolus, which then leads to a loss of elastic recoil during expiration and in turn a decrease in ventilation. Does that make sense? I hope so. So elastase causes the destruction of the elast elastic fibres so that they do not recoil during expiration. So there's 
less carbon dioxide removed during expiration. And there's more air inside the alveolus and the others, therefore we have air trapping. Additionally, the protease okay, that is released from the, the neutrophil um, also leads to the destruction of the alveolus, alveolar wall. Okay, so increase uh, in elastase in the area, loss of elastic fibre, um, and then the protease leads to destruction in the alveolar wall, but it also damages the capillary beds. And that leads to a decrease in perfusion. So you've got a decrease in um, ventilation because of the loss of elasticity, and you have a decrease in perfusion due to the damage to the capillary beds caused by elastase and protease. Does that make sense too? I hope so. So, as I'm sure you know, or can imagine, this is a big problem and impacts on ventilation and perfusion. So the, the, v, the VQ ratio. This is due to the loss of elasticity and destruction of the alveolar wall, and as I've already said a couple of times, leads to air trapping. And that is basically when there is a lot of gas trapped in the alveolus after expiration. So there's oxygen and carbon dioxide trapped in there after the patient has exhaled. This then means that there's an increase in the end expiratory volume and an increase in, uh, and sorry, and that increase is responsible for one of the clinical signs of emphysema, what you might have heard referred to as the hyperinflated chest, also known as the barrel chest. Does that make sense? If your alveoli are all full of air, take a big deep breath, blow it all out, but imagine half of that's still there at the end. Your chest's still inflated. So, emphysematous COPD patients walk about like that, and their chest, therefore, uh, changes shape. So rather than be, you know, rather than have relaxed muscles with the ribs falling in the lungs and pushing air out, because of the hyperinflation and it caused by air trapping, the diaphragm is flattened out and the lungs remain inflated. Um, and that makes the chest look more like a barrel, a round shape, than an oval shape. I hope that makes sense. So because the lungs are not emptying properly, just to clarify, and still have gas trapped inside, the patient has to use accessory muscles. Uh, to increase their work of breathing. All of those factors together lead to this hyperinflated barrel chest that's very common in emphysematous patients, okay? So, um, the decrease in perfusion and the decrease in ventilation that I mentioned earlier leads to a VQ deficit, and that VQ deficit um, that we see is similar to the one that we've looked at in chronic bronchitis, in that there is a decrease in oxygen and um, a decrease in oxygen coming in and an increase in carbon dioxide uh, in the blood, okay? So pulmonary blood supply, there's less oxygen coming in and there is more carbon dioxide remaining there, uh, so therefore not getting out, okay? Okay then, I hope that's been clear and has made sense. I'll just summarise then. In COPD, we see chronic bronchitis present as the blue bloater and emphysema as the pink puffer. This, however, may be an oversimplified look at COPD as it's likely that all COPD patients also have an element of both. So there's some have more chronic bronchitis than emphysema, some have more emphysema than chronic bronchitis, and don't forget that one of these, the other, or indeed both, 
also likely have an element of asthma. Okay? I hope that's been clear. I hope you find that helpful. And I hope you've also found it interesting. Thanks very much for your attention. Um, hopefully speak to you soon.